Good afternoon. <laughs> I just want to tell you that reality is just now starting to sink in that I'm really in America and I'm with you lovely people. I feel like I'm in a family reunion uh, because I don't get to be with other believers that have the same heart as me. And so when I do and I see you guys and I love you so much, I am just so filled with joy. and. You know, we're going to have a reunion in heaven. And if it's going to be more than this, I don't know if I can stand it, but <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that we'll have glorified bodies and we can hold so much more joy. Yeah. Aren't you? So today, uh, I just want to thank the Lord and you for the privilege of being here and the privilege to talk to you. I have so much to tell you. And... Uh, by the time I'm finished, you might know an awful lot about the good and the bad about me and my work, but it's not about me because I want to tell you that in the past nine years, I have gradually, too gradually, learned more and more about the wonderful Savior who is always by my side, always holding my hand, never letting me down, but coming right at the moment when I need him in my heart or in my actions or in my brain. So I just want to give glory to God for everything that I'm about to present today. And uh, I want to start with a little prayer. You don't have to kneel. Dear Lord in heaven, today we just eagerly sit at your feet and want to learn about you. And so today we really, really wish to abandon all our old thoughts, our old self, and the things that's so ugly, and replace it with what you have to offer, which is so much more. So I pray that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit and your divine presence. I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, I'm going to back up because my testimony, my story, is my title. So I'm going to go back. Uh, to the year 2008. And uh, in that year on Christmas Day, it was December 25, 2008, my husband told me he was leaving me. And we had been married for 20 some years and had two young teenage boys. And so it is just amazing to me how in just about 10 seconds of time and almost not even one sentence of words, your whole world can come crashing down around you. And there you are in a pile of broken pieces and covering that is a pile of dirt. And you have, you're in shock and you don't know what to do because I never knew. And in fact, my husband had really left me two years before that, but I didn't know. And so through the trauma and through the pain, a human being likes to uh, lean on another human being. And a pastor picked me up. And you know, there's safety in a multitude of counselors, but they can let you down because they don't know God's ways are so much higher. And he has a plan. And in your worst moments, his plan is the best. And so through my tears and emotions, I listened to this man, and I know I'm to forgive, and forgive was easy, but life was hard. And so I kept forgiving, but it wasn't working. And so four months into it, in April, in despair, I sat at the kitchen table, and I spent all night praying. And in that night, the Lord came to me, and uh, I wrote a poem. And I'm not a poet, and I've never written poetry successfully. You cross out and write again and cross out, and it's not right. This time, I wrote this poem. It was God that wrote it, not me. And I, in my despair, said, Lord, just set me, set me on my feet. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. Please. And the poem, Oh Dear Jesus, Take Control. And uh, this poem is from God, not from me. And from that moment on, God took control of my life. And actually, you know, when I sat there at that table, 
I had no idea what God had in store for me, but I did know He had the best plan, and I wanted to trust Him with that plan with all my heart. And so, contrary to what everybody else was telling me, the Lord directed my path. And you know, there's something about the Lord. He came to heal the brokenhearted, didn't He? And so, it was not very long after that, not even one week after that, my best friend Lisa Sharon called me and said, you know, we need you and the boys to go to Thailand to relieve some missionaries that are going to go on furlough for three months. Can you go? And I think, of course not. I'm in a mess. Look at me. I am skinny as a rail and I am trying to stay alive. I have been dying just a little bit more every day. And so, but I said to her, I will pray about it. And so, yes, I did. We lived in the country in Montana. We did, uh, we have the country block and it's one mile on each side. And so I run that country block and two miles I prayed. And then for two miles I listened. What does the Lord want me to do? And I didn't hear anything. But as soon as I got home and I opened the door, I heard, well, ask God for the money if he wants you to go. And so I said, okay, I get, give me the money if you want me to go. And the next day, Lisa called me and she said, well, you're never going to guess what. But we have the money for you and the boys to do a round trip t uh, ticket to Thailand. And we have your visas also. And a box of medicine and things that somebody donated. I just, in shock, sat down, my mouth wide open, and I said, that was you, Lord. And in less than 30 days, my boys and I were on a plane headed for Thailand. And God, I'm going to tell you something, that God, He knows exactly how to pick up the broken pieces, how to put them all back together better than before, and to clean out the dirt that laid over it. And I want to tell you here today that right now I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. And so when you abandon all for Jesus, you don't have to think you're losing out on anything. And if you've never had a crisis in your life, you will. Because we're in the last days and the devil is hitting us really hard. And if you've devoted all to God and in reckless abandonment said, you just take it all, Lord. You take my family, you take my friends, you take my house, you take my land, you take everything. You don't have to worry that you're giving up anything. You're gaining everything. You are gaining the best. And so uh, I just... Um, I'm so thankful to the Lord for giving me a new start and fulfilling my life with my, my hands with work to do for God. I uh, worked at that school for 10 months and learned a lot. And in that time, I fell in love with the Karen people who have been abused and traumatized by the Burmese soldiers for 65 years. They are displaced. They can't call anything their home. They have only trauma and death in their families and in their villages to think back on. And so uh, they are very needy. They don't know anything. And so uh, to make a long story short, I, uh, after 10 months, I never came back in the three month period that I was supposed to. Uh, God showed me a little village up in the mountains named Biota. And Biota is uh, the way we used to have to drive. It was seven and a half hours on terrible roads. And uh, later the roads got a little better. Now we're taking um, maybe three hours when we can take the shortcut. And that's kind of rare. Thank you. So it's a long way and it's a dirt road and it's um, difficult on a dry and nice day. But uh, three reasons I knew God wanted us to go there is somebody donated us a truck and uh, the principal of the school there named Bleda, he and my boys were good friends and he told us that the Lord is asking him to go with us. And so he, we really needed him for translation and the people. And uh, then we also learned that there's 50 villages around Biota and that many, many of them never heard the name of God or Jesus. And so by that time I was praising the Lord because he had given us a place to work. Now I had left my home in the country. It was a beautiful farm and it had 40 acres and horses and surrounded by mountains in Montana. And I had a convection oven, and I had hot water heater, and I had 
all the nice things in my kitchen. I had a car. I had all these things, but you know, when I left all those things and I'm working for God over there, I don't miss a thing. I have never looked back. And uh, the Lord knows just how to handle you in your weakness and brokenness and pain. So total abandonment. Um, it, I looked up abandonment in the dictionary to hand over, to put in someone's control, to give up completely. And when you think about it, it's really a good word because we want to hand everything over to God. We want to put it in God's control and give everything up ourselves completely. And here I put a couple of um, quotes. Let them seek to retain their possessions for selfish purposes and it will be to their eternal loss. But let their treasure be given to God and from that moment it bears His inscription. It is sealed with His immutability. And then, of course, Luke 14, if any man come to me and hate not <clears throat> his father, mother, wife, and children, brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now that's really strong. It's not hate, but it means God comes first. And in putting God first, your family and your friends and your things are taken better care of than you ever could have. So there's great comfort in that. And not only is this talking about giving up things, but it's talking about giving up your selfishness and your pride and the things in your heart that are so uh, much of abomination to God. He wants to purify and cleanse us for all good works. So my boys, that's a long story. You can read it probably in my webpage. My card is at the desk. But uh, it's just Bledjaw and I that work in Biota now. This young man is 30 years old and he is a committed Christian. His heart is just one with mine. And both of us have this aim to reach the lost in the way that God would have us to do it so we would not miss any opportunities to lead somebody to Jesus, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, or what we have to go through to get to them. And so that is our goal. Now, this young man has worked with me for mm, nine years, but eight years we've been in Biota. So during that time, he's the only one that has stuck with me for eight years in that area, and he has grown. He has become courageous and, uh, and excellent in his work, and I just couldn't tell you enough things about him. If you ever see him, would you please shake his hand? Because he, will, he uh, doesn't know all the friends he has here in America. Now, because I've worked with him so long, I've been, what do you call it, grandfathered into the family? Maybe it's grandmothered in because I am his mother and these are my grandchildren. It's a lovely, lovely family. So here is the trip going to Biota. It is beautiful scenery and in nice weather and when they're not burning and it's all smoky, the view is spectacular. And all through these mountains, tucked away, all through them are little Karan villages in little bamboo huts, living like they used to live 100 years ago in Burma. They don't know much. And uh, this is um, where we live. It's something about right there. It's in uh, almost an upper, I don't know, upper part of, of Thailand as the villages. Our people, just like all of Thailand, mostly it's Buddhist. And uh, so our people worship Buddha and have Buddhist relics and things in their home. And, and they know, but they don't know everything about Buddha because many, many, many of them are devil worshipers. They worship the devil and they have to go through so many sacrifices of their animals, so many rituals and ceremonies. I'm still learning some of them that they have to go through to worship the devil. And uh, it is very sad, but we, little by little, are helping them to see that there's a better way, that there is no answer. These things cannot help them. They tie the devil's strings around the wrists, abdomen, neck, and ankles, especially of the babies, so that that is to protect them from all harm and danger, and it's also supposed to keep them from being sick. So uh, you will see strings everywhere. Now this is what the babies look like in their faces when they first see me because I'm the only white person and they've never seen one before and they are just 
And some of them would cry when they see me from here to the door of the church. They'd look at me and cry. And that's really a downer, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Later, m many of them really, really love me. And I am in love with the children around me and the babies. There's nothing like the Karen children and babies, uh, or the grand people for that matter. Every loss that I have experienced in my life, the bigger it is, the more love God gives me for other people. And these people have got a chord in my heart. They are uh, wonderful people, and uh, they learn very slowly. And as I walk through the villages and go from place to place, I see people old and young that would have been dead today if I hadn't been there, and that if God hadn't put me in the right place at the right time. So I'm so thankful. There's a lot of stories behind all these people. Now, a lot of Korean people have a lot of children, and not because they cannot get birth control, but a lot of people don't want to take it. This lady is allergic, she says, to birth control and doesn't want to get any other surgical procedure for her and her husband. But every time she has a baby, she almost dies. And this is her eighth baby, this little one right here. It's her eighth baby, and it gets worse every time. The first time we saw her, we had a whole change of plans and decided to go to this village, and there she was. She had to go to the hospital, and we had to take her, and she spent three weeks in the hospital. That's how sick she was. And uh, so this, consequently, the children become the caregivers. Very young children take total care of the babies. Um, at a, a very young age, they cook, and they... They work in the gardens and they do many things. Now, for the first four years in Biota, I lived in a bamboo hut and we started cooking outside because when we moved, we had nothing. And we, uh, as I was treating the sick in the bamboo hut, I decided, Lord, I want to pray for a small concrete building because I can treat the sick on a clean floor and I can hose that floor down, I can clean it. This is a bamboo floor and the babies don't have diapers and the adults spit and push it through the cracks of the bamboo and it's really hard to keep it clean. And of course I didn't have much stuff, but I give everything I have away. And as I gave, the Lord gave to me. And as I prayed for a small concrete building, just a room, to treat the sick in, this is what the Lord gave me. And this is a clinic and a house put together. I don't have time to tell you four major miracles that put this thing together because we didn't have any money. We didn't have any friends, we, really. And uh, we just prayed. And as we went to get more supplies to build this building, the Lord gave more. And everything that we went to buy, instead of the cheapest thing, then the more expensive quality thing was on sale. It was on promotion, and we would get that. And even the builder, I would love to tell you this whole story, but there is not time. But our house, it sits on the highest spot of the whole village. And so when we dedicated this building to God and brought all the people together to dedicate this, we told them, this is for you. This is not for us, but this is God. He loves you and wants you to be well taken care of and to learn how to be healthy and to know God. And so we've had a lot of teaching experiences with these people. We are uh, in a um, village of about 27 to 30 homes. We are right next to a government school. So I'm the school nurse as well as for everybody else. And this picture was taken by Jonathan with a drone so we can get a bird's eye view of the village. God knows our wants and has provided for them. The Lord has a treasure house of supplies for his children and can give them what they need under all circumstances. And I'm here to tell you it is true. We are so doubting. We're so miserable as human beings in our brain because we want to say this is not possible. But you know, God is right. All things are possible through him. And time and time again, he has done wonderful things for us. This church is our church. It has a tin roof, and it's a fine tin roof. But in the rainy season, the rain pelts down so hard that you can't hear. And somebody could sing or pray right next to your ear, and you won't hear it, a thing. Um, sometimes when I get up to preach, I pray because the rain is too hard and no sense to even have a worship service. And I pray, Lord, stop the rain. You're in charge of the weather. And I'll get up and just open my mouth and that rain just stops. It's like electric current just stops. And so the, the people see the hand of God. But somebody has uh, just recently 
uh, wanted to help put the church roof on. So we now have a church roof that matches our roof. And the, in the rain, it's quite quiet and, and lovely. The next slide is a, a video that Jonathan Hill put together when he visited me and put the drone up. And you can see my village from the air. So you can see we're just a little village nestled away in the mountains with nothing else um, around. It's And so now this is my clinic. The house is on one side, the clinic is on the other. And in the rainy season, we don't have to go anywhere. We're right in the same building. And it's very convenient. There's a counter to work on. There's a place to do charting. And there's a uh, counter. There's even a sink. We have a pipe in the window because they don't know how to put in a plumbing or do the pipes. And this is my patient charts. These are my patient cards. And as of last Sunday, the day I left, I took this, pic, uh, this picture of the clinic, and uh, I, I counted the number of villages that have been treated in that clinic. Uh, 89 different villages have been treated in that clinic, and many people more than once. And uh, you sometimes wonder, why do they come here? They're passing up other clinics. But they say, we hear that you get better when you come here. And so they come, and we say, it's not us, but we pray with you, and that's the God in heaven that you need to know to, because he hears and answers and helps you get well. So baby scales are great. And there's even cupboards. It's just really a blessing to uh, be able to work uh, out of all these things. Now the patients come. And uh, like with the public, sometimes very busy, other times not. But they will have different complaints. See if you can diagnose these complaints. Many times they come and they say, you know, the blood starts in my feet and it goes up my legs. And when it gets to my body, it goes back and forth. And by the time it gets to my head, I'm really in trouble. Can you help me? <laughs> and then other people say, you know, my heart is drying out. What can I do? My heart is drying out. Other times, a lady, actually three people that I can remember, my brains are rotting out. And then another one is when I bend over, my brains fall out. And then they'll say other things like they believe that their medicine all runs out of their body after one year. So every year they think they need an IV. And they come to me, they want an IV, and I will not do it because I will only use an IV when it's absolutely necessary. But they come and they think they need an IV. Other people, they have the fry smell. And the fry smell is real, guys. I, I laughed at it at first, but for Karen people, it is real. They think that if somebody's frying something and they already have like a bad knee or they've got uh, stomach pain, this is just gonna get worse. And you know, like Harvey Steck said this morning, 90% of all sickness comes from the mind. And they get sick. In fact, the neighbor, our neighbor had the fry smell hit her like that, and she ran and got that frying pan and threw it out the door. And she would go crazy. And her relative, her older sister, died of the fry smell. And so you had to be careful because you can't burn anything because of the fry smell. We see patients because of three different reasons. Poor hygiene, poor nutrition, and not drinking enough water. Those are the three things that bring patients to me. But also there's many, many other things. Like any clinic, you will see many things like abscesses. We treat um, three patients for seizures. This little boy, Jawbaw, he's, um, he's nine there, but he's now 10. We've treated him since a baby because his mother, when she was giving birth to him, she stood up and he fell out on his head. So he is mentally backwards, and he has terrible seizures. So as he's grown, we've been giving him heavier doses of medicine to stop the seizures. Also, big groups of people come. This is a group of people that's well-dressed, really, really lovely people, very happy. But they've come from a wedding, 
And at weddings, it's bad news because they uh, act kind of like a lion in the Kalahari Desert because they, in a the wedding, they will slaughter the pig and then they will not cook that pig, but they will chop it, chop it, and chop it, and chop it. And everybody eats that raw meat from that pig. And so people are really sick. There's all kinds of things. We have had to have emergency surgery on two bellies because of intussusception of the bowel or twisted bowel or other things. There's all kinds of diarrhea and there's, of course, trichomonas that can affect you later like arthritis. And everybody hurts everywhere, so, and everybody has pigs. So figure that. So uh, also this group of ladies, Everybody with a different complaint. Sometimes we spend all day working with a whole group of people and we can deliver a lovely health message on some of the eight natural remedies. Some of them they're unnatural at, we don't even talk about it, but the things that they need like water and other things. This lady, she said to me, I am amazed. I'm totally amazed because I have been to doctors, I have been to hospitals, I have had this pain and this sickness for years and you come to my house one time and I am well. And I said, you know, Grandma, this is because we pray. And the Lord in heaven, you need to pray. We need to teach you how to pray. He's the one that does this stuff for you. So many people do need IVs. They're um, dehydrated to the max. There's a lot of... Um, uh, tropical diseases also that if you don't get them right away you need to take them to the hospital because they can be fatal. I know because I had it and it was a miracle I got to the hospital. Also the skin. Some of the babies come and they are so dirty. Many times I just take them in the bathroom and I scrub them down and then I can treat them and at least and I had a new little dress for this girl and at least for the 30 minutes while they were with me they were still clean and I could enjoy that but then you give the medicine and uh, you try to give soap and explain and have them. Now, dermatological uh, problem, dermatology, uh, I need to be a dermatologist and I need to be a urologist. I need to be everything and I'm nothing. But the Lord helps us and in our ignorance, He has the wisdom and as you pray and look at the people, you can figure out if it's an allergy or find out what their habits are. And sometimes you keep people a long time and ask a lot of questions before you know exactly what might be going on with the people. Uh, lung problems are terrible because we have three seasons. We have cold, hot, and rainy. And each season is very hard on lungs and children uh, and adults because the cold season is very cold. If it's 50 degrees outside, we freeze because it's the same inside and our water is cold. And uh, in the hot season, uh, the people are um, burning their fields two months out of the hot season and smoke is thick and soot is falling into your house and, and so there's still lung problems. And in the rainy season, goes unexplained. The sickness is horrible and you can't even take them to the hospital, you're it in rainy season. So we treat an awful lot of bad lungs, old and young. And the babies. We also have quite a bit of trauma. This one is the trauma of the eye. But a lot of times, the people will be doing something like they have a long bamboo pole and a plastic bag, and they collect red ant eggs out of the top of the trees because they eat those. It's delicacy. And as they're doing that, the red ant, it's happened many times, fall in their eye and bite them in the eye. And so there's a lot of pain associated with that. This young man, uh, came across a wild elephant face to face in a blind corner and you have to ditch your bike and run fast because they kill. They charge you and kill. And this guy wrecked his bike and tore his foot up in the process of getting away from the wild elephant. I had to work on his foot a long time. Um, simple lacerations. Don't watch, Jonathan. I told you I'd warn you. Um, it will happen quite often because of the motorbikes, motorbike accidents, tree branches hitting the top of the head, and the, the machete knife is used for everything, even cutting fingernails, and uh, also they cut trees with them. I could show you some really bad lacerations, but I won't. This lady got her tendon and many blood vessels in that finger and 16 stitches. Later, she's ready to go home, and she also is the one that almost destroyed her thumb two years before that. And so it's, it's hanging there lifeless on her hand. We have, where I live in that place, kind of northern Thailand, is in the center of the heaviest opium area of the whole country. We're in the biggest area of opium, so everybody grows it for 
our money. They can sell it quite easily if they get it processed and take it to the street. But it's illegal and the soldiers are trying to knock it out. And out of all the people that smoke opium, many people mainline it. So that becomes heroin and it is deadly. And when they come to you and they're heroin, heroin users and they're in shock, you can't hardly start an IV on them because there's no vein. They try to get that needle in three times a day to get the opium. They use their legs, their arms, their shoulders, everything they can find. And when I want to start an IV, it's really hard. This man is on opium. He's constantly coming with abscesses and sores. We're constantly scrubbing people's legs and arms and whatever it is. This is uh, like three months before that, he had an abscess on his arm. When you're on opium, you can't take care of your house. You can't grow your rice. This is the kind of dwellings that they live in falling down all around them. And we, we help them, we build another house for them, but we mostly want to give them a new life and help them. Three ways of transportation for us in the mountains is walking, motorbike, or truck. And sometimes on nice days we walk because you have to cross like a one log river or go across places a motorbike can't go or climb steeper. So we take the medicine on our back and three days a week we go to another village. Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday we will go to another village with medicine. This is how it works. And in the rain, it's quite nasty sometimes and difficult because it's um, very slippery and everything is steep because we're in the mountain. And one day, we were going to a village which we hadn't been to for a while, and they had set up a rice garden uh, right here on this mountain. And so it destroyed the path that we're used to taking to get to that village. So we lost our way through that rice garden and we climbed a whole extra mountain out of our way. It normally takes almost two hours to walk and it took us three hours to finally get to that village and the mud and the rain crossing the rivers and finally we got to the village. But it's worth it because everywhere we go we uh, have a routine of treating the patients. They cook for us and then we teach them something about God. So we try to bring the picture roll. Pictures are better than thousands of words for these people. They are fascinated. They love the pictures and I think that they can remember better with that. This is our usual load that we have with medical supplies and uh, medicine and uh, things. And uh, this bike has gone where it really is not supposed to go. It goes everywhere. Bledjaw's become a great driver. I've become um, a great trusting person on the back. And I've come kind of like glue to hang on because I have totally flipped off the back head over heels three times. But in the last year and a half, I haven't fallen off one time. Here, I'm going to show you a video of a little, uh, just a little part of one of our trips one day. It was an easy trip because it was Sabbath. We were just coming back from a village uh, after removing st stitches from a lady after C-section. So I want to show you just how it is on a motorbike. I don't think there's sound, but I'll talk. We're going through a rice field and uh, it's, it's nice because it's dry today, but it's narrow and technical, and if you have more supplies with you, it's very difficult. And if you fall off to the right, it's really bad because it's straight down and it's very narrow. I showed this to Natalie and she said, that doesn't look bad at all. I said, well, try it at night in the rain and see how you like that with a bag of medicine on there. That somehow we make it. We don't just pray casually when we leave the house. We pray earnestly. We need God every second just to hang on to our hands. Sometimes I just reach my hand up to heaven and I say, oh Lord, just save us from this because there's mountain after mountain of difficulty to go through. And then we go down that steep, steep hill and then we go to the water. And this is dry season. the water and the rocks. And sometimes we have a big load because we want to bring blankets and mosquito nets and medicine to villages. But somehow I have the backpack on my back and I have that other thing on my knee and he's got the bag in front of him and off we go. And we always make it. 
And at the village, we, uh, as soon as we go into the, a house, everybody comes to be treated. So we treat all the patients first of all, and they gather around, and one by one, we try to figure out what we can do to really help that person. We pray with the patients. Sometimes we have to leave that house and go to different houses where people can't walk, and they say, somebody's sick over here, and we go over there. The, Trouble diseases. This lady is a heroin addict also, and she drinks alcohol, and she got her hand in a boiling oil. And I was really scared that there were third degree burns in the creases here, and I kind of think they were. But uh, some friends of mine told me about um, cold pressed coconut oil for burns, and it works. I treated her, tried to go back to that village as often as I could, but you know, you can't go every day to these places. But she's gotten well, and we hope that she can have a better lifestyle. God, this is wonderful, just listen. God reaches hearts through the relief of physical suffering. A seed of truth is dropped into the mind and is watered by God. Much patience may be required before this seed shows signs of life, but at last it springs up and bears fruit unto eternal life. So such a blessing to have these words of comfort from God. These people had uh, amoebic dysentery and very sick. I just want to impress upon you how fortunate we are, even me and my house over there, to have things. We can cook, we can have glasses to drink out of. These people, they live in this little square thing. It's a mother and son, deathly sick, fevers, and amoebic dysentery, diarrhea they've had for a week, they could die. And I give ORS, I can't go anywhere. I can't take them anywhere, but I can treat them right there. And they have a little tin cup. Do you see it? This little tin cup right there. It's been sawed in half. And then they put the ORS in there and put a little water from that hot kettle on that. And then they're sharing that ORS to help themselves. And uh, sometimes you just want to cry out to God to help these people. This lady also has a bad problem. The hospital couldn't help her. Said it was a psych problem, but her legs are numb from the waist down after having her baby. And so I try to do massage and go as often as I can, and she's getting well. Whatever is done out of pure love, be it ever so little in the sight of man, is wholly fruitful. So, you know, nothing goes unnoticed by God. He sees and hears, he knows. He knows our hearts in the work and he knows the little things that we do. And then after we treat the sick, they feed us. Sometimes we have a meal like this. This is a cold gourd that had been boiled the day before and chili sauce that might have um, grubs in it or rat. That they put those things in there. So we can eat a little rice and a little gourds with our fingers. We eat, sit there and eat. And then after the meal, we get to share Jesus with the people. And it is a magical hour. You know, Mrs. White says that heaven draws closer to the worker for God than many should suppose when you're sharing Jesus with the people. And you can feel it. It's like heaven on earth. And you teach the people a little bit about Jesus and then you pray. And when you open your eyes, they're still like that with their head bowed. And you know, God can do something with these ignorant poor people. Even though we don't feel skilled at reaching their hearts, God can. These people took this whole picture roll after it was finished and looked at every picture and Bledjaw explained a lot of the stories in the Bible to them. They will get, this is my Bible first pictures, they will get those pictures and they will study those pictures for a long time after the worship. But Satan knows just how to interrupt. He's got artful things set up for every single appeal that you want to make. Usually it's the children start fighting or there's a dog fight under the house. This time, there's a rooster and he's tied to that pole because the people want to keep him underhand. And as soon as I got to the most important part, that rooster started to crow right above our heads as loud as he could. Time after time after time, wouldn't stop. We just had to let him have full uh, attention. And he took the worship for quite a while. And then people will call us to their house and you know, just like I'm, I'm no different than anybody else because sometimes people call us to go somewhere and inside I groan. And I think, oh Lord, do we have to go? I'm so tired, we've just done all this work. And this man is calling us to go to his village. His daughter has a breathing problem, but it could be really bad. So we have decided from the beginning that no matter what people say, if they call us to go, we're gonna go. 
if physically possible at all, we're going to go. Because sometimes the, the people tell us, and they make it sound like it's really terrible. The person's almost dying. And we go, we get our stuff, and we go, and we find that there's nothing wrong with that person. They're perfectly fine. Other times, they make it sound like, you know, it's, you don't have to go today. It's okay. And we go, and they're half dead or three-quarters dead. And so we checked this man's daughter, and we were very tired, but she was in acute asthma attack, and I had a Ventolin inhaler, and that helped her, brought it right out. Sometimes we're going to a village, we've got our plans all set, you know, we've got the plan, and yet people are coming to visit us at the house, and we've already left, and we're halfway to the village, and we really can't turn around and go back, and their faces are all falling. Oh, she's going. Look, there she goes. And so we stop, and sometimes we do clinic right on the side of the road with the motorcycle, motorcycle clinic, and we give shots, and we um, do urine analysis, and we check the sick. We have our medicine in that bag right there. Sometimes we're walking, and the people are working in the rice fields, and they come, and we treat the sick right there. Um, the next miracle, in 2015 when I were here, we just got this truck. And uh, it's our second truck. The first one tore up because we hauled all the building material for the house. And this is a huge miracle from God. It's a very strong, good truck, and we've been the total owners of it. We take good care of it. It's uh, broken down three times. One time the axle broke, and then the CV joints broke. But God says, the means in our possession may not seem to be sufficient for the work. But if we will move forward in faith, believing in the all-sufficient power of God, abundant resources will open before us. If the work be of God, he himself will provide the means for its accomplishment. He will reward honest, simple reliance on him. And he does because we get real attached to our trucks because so many miracles, we, we're trying to get a patient home and it's just raining and it's muddy. We're not going to make it. And we pray and that engine roars and those tires squeal and we're spinning all over the place and we try seven times and then we make it. And so the, the trucks become very special because angels have touched our truck. And this is no exception here. This is a total miracle. I might have told you in 2015, so I'm not making a big deal. But we got caught in the rain halfway to Beota. We had to turn around and come back because the road is worse going than coming. And we're on a concrete section, but it goes down a steep hill and makes a hairpin turn. And the red mud had washed over the road. It is more slippery than ice. And our truck went out of control. And when it starts to skid, it builds up momentum. The velocity just went And that truck, the back end, swung around. And we, we were headed. We were we were supposed to really go over that cliff. The devil was kicking us right off the mountain. That is a very steep cliff, and that is a very soft bank on that side. But our truck stopped right on the edge of the precipice. And it took us almost two hours to get ourselves out of that bad mess because we're on the side of this mountain all by ourselves working on that. Now, I want to tell you briefly about the elephants. For the first four years, the elephants that we saw were all tame. People wrote on them, they're important, they're worth almost $40,000, um, 800 to 1 million Thai baht. And so the people value their elephants, they're females and they're trained. They pull the um, big posts to make the houses and they're very nice. But then the wild elephants join them and they are very dangerous. When they get in heat, oil comes from the side of their face, it's called must. And the mush, uh, when it comes down, makes that elephant wild and very dangerous. You look in Wikipedia, and it will tell you that these, uh, when they're in musk, they must be isolated and uh, taken away because they're very dangerous to humans and other elephants. But in my jungle mountains, there is no zoo, there is no moat, there is no fence, and there is no way to isolate these guys. And the villagers really want them to breed with the females because when she has a baby, it's going to be worth so much money. So it's a money thing also. But in the meantime, people die. These guys charge, and whether they're in must or not, there's some that have more evil disposition than others. This little one here, its legs are tied, and uh, because it charges really, the big one has a broken leg. I can't even find the, it's a video. But uh, the little one will charge, and they've tied his front two legs together, so he's, he's trying to come. Now, I took this picture, I didn't, I mean, I didn't take this picture. I got this picture from um, off the computer to show you the size of the elephant compared to a pickup truck. And these elephants right near my village have destroyed two government trucks that are bigger than our pickup truck. 
And they also had broken walls and terrified the people. Many people uh, have fled for their lives and some lose their life. Uh, because we travel the road more frequently than anybody else, we uh, pray earnestly about the elephants. They're there now. We passed just coming out seven piles of fresh elephant dung. But uh, for the past year, we have not met one face to face. But this day, we met this one face to face and uh, couldn't turn around. We're in the truck and we're backing up slowly and this guy's coming. But the angels tranquilized this one. You know, they can stop the mouths of the lions in Daniel's, uh, when he was in the lion's den, they can take care of the elephants. We're in a really grave situation this day and we're taking this man to the hospital. This older man, he's in a lot of abdominal pain, but we have to go by motorbike up the shortcut, which is very difficult. It took us a long time to get him up there. He's with his son, I'm with Bloodjaw, two motorbikes. When we got up there, we see three motorbikes and six people right here at this spot. And they say, don't go, don't go, there's an elephant ahead. So we waited, and we waited almost an hour, and we think, we gotta get this man to the hospital, we gotta go. So two of the motorbikes with four people left. They were decided not to try. And one brave uh, couple came with us, and so there's three of us on bikes. Well, nobody wanted to go first, so Bledjaw and I, we went first. And on the top of that mountain, it's uh, real eerie up there because the clouds come down. It's very cold. It's very windy. You can't hear anything. You can hardly see anything. I can't see the clock in the back of this room. It's very misty and the clouds are blowing, blowing. And so we go around the first corner and I'm looking. I don't see anything. I'm trying to remember where the boulders are because there's big rocks. And the second corner, go slow, and we're looking. I don't see anything. The third corner, I go, now was there a boulder right there or not? And suddenly it raised its head. And there it was no, it was just as close as the back door to this church from me here. And it didn't take the, us long. The back, people on the back jumped off. The driver spun the bike around. We jumped back on and we took off. Now we're the last to leave. First to get there, last to leave. And I'm looking back to see, is that guy going to charge us? And I don't see it. I said, no, he's not coming, not coming. So we go back to this spot right here. And while we're standing there, we hear another one to the left. And so we go back further. And the other people leave. It's just us four now. But we say, Lord, you're bigger than the elephants. We need to take this man to the hospital. Please help us. We waited 45 minutes and then decided we're going to go. And so we slowly proceeded. And we got around all three corners. And we got all the way through. And we got to the hospital. The man was properly taken care of. Many times we're going to go to another village, but we see these footprints in the dirt. And we cannot go because it's like suicide to follow an elephant on their path. Another thing is the cobras. Now, <clears throat> I don't take pictures of the cobras, and I don't kill the cobra. We just get out of its way. So I took this picture, but many times, I can assure you, I have stumbled over a black snake like that. I haven't seen its head, but you know, in the overgrowth and you're walking through with your flip-flops on, you, it surprises you, because many times you don't see one and you kind of forget about it. But then there they are. And some of them can, are spitting cobras and they can get you right in the eye from six meters away. Others will chase you and you can't get away because they've got no legs or traction, but they're fast. This one is a red-necked crate and very dangerous. And one day I'm working in the garden and I see one. It's just come past me and it's going to the front porch and it goes on the porch of my house and Bledjaw's not there. So I think I've got to kill this snake because it's going to go in my house. And I had the hoe, right? And so I prayed quickly and chopped that, chopped that snake all to pieces. And I'm very thankful. I was kind of nervous to do that. But obviously, I couldn't have a picture of it to show you after I chopped it all to pieces. And this one, I didn't take this one either. This one is another type of king cobra, very dangerous. And the brown color, you can't see it in the mud. And one day, we're on the motorbike going to a village. I'm on the back, of course. And we're trying to make it up a place. And it's a steep cliff here uh, going down and a bank on this side. And we seldom can make it all the way up that when it's raining. This just happened not too long ago. And there was a big rock on the left. And we've got a thin passageway to the right of the rock rock in the bank. And so we're making it. I don't have to uh, eject off the back of the bike at all. I'm still on. And we get up to the rock, and all of a sudden, Bledjaw just turns the bike into the rock. And I said, 
what was that? And we're about to, to dump over, and I'm trying to get my foot back on the ground, and I see the snake just like this, and its head is up. Usually I see the back of the snake, and we know it's a cobra because they move slow. They're the king of the jungle. This one was had its head up and its hood open. It's the closest we've ever gotten to your naked leg. Right there, that head raising up. And you just feel like the smiling, uh, cynical face of Satan looking up at you. And, uh, but that, that guy, he um, slowly walked away. I don't have time to go into some of these stories. Each morning, got to listen to this, consecrate yourselves to God for that day. Make no calculation for months or years. These are not yours. One brief day is given to you, as if it were your last on earth, work during its hours for the master. Lay all your plans before God to be carried out or given up, as his providence shall indicate. Accept his plans instead of your own, even though their acceptance requires the abandonment of cherished projects. Projects And just like um, Harvey Stack said this morning, every day you've got to re reconnect with God and reaffirm um, that this day belongs to you, Lord. Because when you least want to go somewhere, you've got to go somewhere. This man, we worked hard with him. Had to take him to the hospital. The sky was bad. The day was bad. We had to wait in the hospital for hours. All these patients had to be seen. We got him admitted. He got the right care. Then we had to come home. By then, it's raining. So we really have a hard time. But you know what? No matter what hard time you have to go through to take care of somebody, there's a reward. We might not know it here, but it might be in heaven. These people called us later and they said, could you come and teach us about your God? We want to get rid of the devil's strings, and we want to know how to be a Christian. So that beautiful day, we cut these devil's strings off of that family, and now the wife faithfully comes to church. The man uh, comes sometime. And you know, heaven and earth approach each other when you share Jesus with the people. There is no time to talk about this. Now, I want to just, in closing, talk about teeth, because this is really, really applicable to Faith Camp 2018. Because last time I was here, it was Faith Camp 2015, and I had a burden on my heart when I left Biota that time to come to America. I prayed to the Lord. Nobody knew about my prayer. I said, Lord, I just don't feel uh, good about pulling teeth because I had held off on that as long as possible. I didn't want to pull teeth, but people come with such pain and they have no other alternative but to try to get it out themselves with a machete. And then they come back with an infection. And so I said, Lord, I can do better than that. So I had some old instruments and um, I had the book where there's no dentist. And so I studied this thing and I look at this and I'm pulling teeth. Well, I pulled about 30, but I feel like I'm not I'm not good enough for these people. I just feel so inadequate. And I, I kneel down and pray every time, and these teeth have come out. So that's a miracle. So I come and I show this picture in my first tooth that came out and like that. And then I walk home. I'm walking out that door, and Dr. Jack Hamilton and his wife, they fall in step with me, and he says, I'm a dentist. <gasps> I said, oh, I'm sorry. I pull teeth, and I've got no right to do it. And I, I'm sorry because I think he should chew me out. I don't know anything. But no, he takes me to his tent. He has come from Alaska for the very first time that year. He had brought a box of instruments, dental instruments. And I said, oh, he showed it to me. And I said, oh, did you think you were going to pull teeth here? He said, no. He said, I was impressed that somebody might need them. And I was able to ask him all the questions that I had on my heart, and, and he shows me these instruments, way, these things are archaic, they're no good, and he shows me this stuff, and he gives me the box of instruments, and that's not the best. Last year, he come to visit, and they came for a whole week, and we pulled teeth together. Here he is. Here he is, and uh, totally, we went to the school, and we went to different villages, and we pulled 17 teeth together and he walked me through and talked me through and helped me so much and left me instruments. And when he left, I felt so lonely and I felt so inadequate once again and I'm there and I've, 
I've got to pull teeth, but way more confident than I was before. And now these are the instruments that I can use to help the people. And so way more teeth have been pulled, but there's times when I pray, oh Lord, I wish Dr. Hamilton and his wife were here now. Because this lady comes in, she'd fallen off the bamboo ladder of her house, and she had broken her eye tooth, the um, canine tooth, completely open, and it was the raw nerve, and she's in a lot of pain, and I knew that tooth had to come out, but it's the hardest one because it's the strongest one in the corner and at the top, and it's got a long root, longer than you think. Well, this lady was patient, and I was tortured because I'm trying, it takes me over an hour to pull that tooth, and it's gotta come out. It's really open and raw. And so I get blisters on my hands, and I'm working, and then I rest, and then I work, and she says, they're so sweet. She says, it's really in there tight, isn't it? And I said, yes. And then finally that whole thing came out. With prayer, the angels got that, that tooth out. So there's so much to praise God about, and I wanna tell you something. It's worth climbing any mountain. It's worth trying to get pushed off the cliff. It's worth any amount of leeches on your feet. It's worth any amount of loss of sleep, hunger, thirst, or whatever you want to go through to see one soul saved in heaven. We don't know now who it is, but the joy is intense. It's joyful right now. And I want to tell you something else. This is the apostles. I'm finished. I'm just going to finish up here. This is the apostles when they left Jesus. They had worked side by side with Jesus for three and a half years. And after he was gone, they had an intense longing to carry on the work that he had started. And how do we stand today? They were filled with an intense longing to carry forward the work he had begun. They realized the greatness of their debt to heaven and the responsibility of their work. Strengthened by the endowment of the Holy Spirit, they went forth, filled with zeal to extend the triumphs of the cross. The Spirit animated them and spoke through them. They had consecrated their lives to him for service, and their very features bore the evidence to the surrender they had made. Where is that surrender in us today? I say, oh Lord, please give me a reckless abandonment every moment for you, because it's worth it, and it is so valuable, and we won't complain a bit when we get to heaven because um, suffering will be cheap enough when we get to heaven. And I want to end with Jim Elliot. I have been so thrilled about Jim Elliot and his friends all his life. He studied to be a missionary to the Alka, Alka Indians in Ecuador. And that's a savage tribe. Alka means savages. There is not a single stranger that has ever stayed for one night and survived because they have spears and they spear everyone. But Jim Elliott has been called of God and he knows it to go to the Alka Indians. And he's worked his life and now he's 28 years old and it's uh, January 5, 1956. And he's going to make his first trip into the Alcas. They have dropped in um, presents and food and tried to, to say some friendly phrases to the Indians to get ready for this time. And he and four of his friends flew by airplane into the beach on the landing in front of that village. And their hearts are totally in this work, totally recklessly abandoned to the work of God and the call he's given them to do. They don't mind if it costs them their lives. And five days later, they were stabbed to death. They were speared and massacred on the beach uh, by the people that they so dearly loved and wanted to reach. And later, they found the diary of some of these men. The pilot that brought them in, in his diary, it says, every time I take off, I am ready to deliver up the life that I owe to God. And Jim Elliot, God, please send me to the Alcas. Um, this day with God, he'd written in his book, give me souls buried now in the rubbish of error or I die. Bring them to a knowledge of truth as it is in Jesus. And he said, I pray thee, Lord Jesus, light these idle sticks of my life and may I burn for thee. I seek not a long life, 
but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. And a song was written about them. Jesus had called them. He said, come and follow me, and they came. With reckless abandonment, they came. And they answered, we will abandon it all for thee, for the sake of the call. And the last thing that they found by Jim Elliot was this statement. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. So with that thought, I want to leave us all because we need a more intense longing for souls. Jesus died to save each one of us. And it's only not our fault that we've grown up with all this knowledge that we have that other people don't have. So we just want to be like Jim Elliot and we want to be like the disciples that just left the side of the Lord and we're in their shoes. We have the same responsibility and it's bigger now because we are so close to the time of the end. Right now, Jesus is at the door. He is coming and I want to be ready to meet him with the people he sends me to. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, today <clears throat> we want to, th to thank you because we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, and we need a cleansing. We need to be uh, used by you, but first we've got to empty our hearts. We've got to empty them of pride and self. We've got to empty them of our belongings, and we've got to tell you, Lord, that you just take control of our life. And every day, every moment, the devil is attacking, Lord, and we need the strength of that you gave the apostles, the strength that you gave Jim Elliot and his companions. We need the reckless abandonment, Lord, to you every hour. And so I pray, Lord, that you will take the empty sticks of our lives and light them up as a fire for you, not a full life, but one, um, not a long life, but one that is full of the love of Jesus to carry to others. And so our life is in your hands. We give it all to you, knowing that we haven't given up anything, but we've gained so much. You are precious, loving, so kind, Heavenly Father, to be patiently putting up with our humanness so that you can lead us to higher heights of bliss and joy in reckless abandonment for you. And so we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen.